All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of The Ethical Consumer. I am here with Courtney Boyd Myers of Akua. And you, I was going to say Akua Kelp Jerky, but you are expanding very rapidly. So we're not just on jerky, we're on noodles. And there's a secret new project that is now <laughs> out in the multimedia sphere. So welcome, Courtney. Thank you, Julia, for having me. And yes, we are expanding. Fast Company just broke the news yesterday, so we can say the kelp burger is coming. I saw. I'm so excited. And then let's see. So how did this all start? It started with jerky, but I'm sure there's a story behind the first package of kelp-based jerky. What was your journey into this? Yeah, you know, it started with kelp. And even before that, it started with climate change. So I was in tech and startups for most of my career. And as I was turning the corner on 30 years old, I was like, thinking a lot more seriously about legacy, having children, what I would tell those children and their children that I was doing during this period in my life when, uh, you know, I think we're going to look back in time as one of the most important shifts in terms of global awakening to climate change and the environment. Um, And I wanted to have a really good answer for my future grandkids, you know, and I was looking at food systems, looking at regenerative agriculture, took a trip out to my first kelp farm to learn about regenerative aquaculture. And to use one of the first ocean puns of the day, I was hooked. And uh, I've been obsessed with getting more people to eat kelp ever since. Nice. I love it. And we really like puns on here. So please keep them coming. <laughs> I'll try to use as many as I can. Yes. And you were actually, so you were the third kelp guest we have had on the podcast. And all of you have been just a little bit different too. Um, our first guest was Pat Schnatler from 12 Tides, who you know. Who I, I just literally have 12 Tides, the new um, chips and the new packaging, literally just over on my kitchen counter. And ate an entire bag for lunch yesterday because I was like, oh, it's kelp, so it's chips and I can eat it. It's healthy. (laughs) Heck, yes, it is. I just got some in as well for the giveaway we're having. They're one of our giveaway sponsors. So I'm excited to have some of our listeners and some of our viewers um, get their paws on it too because I'm in Iowa and it just takes a second to get here. Like you are in some stores in the Bay Area. He's in some stores in the Bay Area and Maine, I think. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. uh, Yeah, exactly. And then... E-commerce has been especially important in 2020 as not all of the shops are open and not not all of those connections have been able to be made with launching new products and getting new things um, off the ground. Has that affected you at all? Do you notice or I mean, has 2020 been just like a cakewalk? <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I don't think 2020 has been a cakewalk for anyone unless maybe like the team at Zoom, but it's... Uh... It's been filled with struggles on like a mental level and I think personal level and um, the business though, we've been really lucky. You know, we are a direct to consumer food company that sells healthy food online. And when March happened, we launched like bulk packaging, thinking people would want to stock up on kelp jerky and they did. And we started, um, paid advertisements on Facebook because so many brands pulled their budgets. And so it became very cheap to acquire new customers. Um, We launched on Amazon. And so I think that, you know, the business actually got this kickstart that it really, really needed um, in terms of growth. And that growth is now a much more healthy number, kind of 20% month over month. But it was during the pandemic, like we were doubling every month. Oh my gosh. Um, Yeah. And then I guess, you know, the business wasn't totally, you know, unscathed. We certainly had, you know, relationships with our co-packer that were strained because we couldn't go up there and be in the facility doing R&D. You know, we have to manage things over FaceTime. And then I was just kicking off a fundraise and asking people for money in the middle of a pandemic is is really, really uncomfortable. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) <laughs> it's been amazing to see, you know, kind of which which industries and which companies, which people have been most affected. All of us have been impacted so much mentally, familially, being able to see people, not being able to see people. And yes, thank goodness for Zoom and Skype, uh, not sponsored, but what would we do without them? Um, it's it's been it's it's been a lifesaver. Social media has been, you know, kind of not the healthiest thing, I think, because we've all been on it so much, but it's also so beneficial because you can keep in contact when you're using it mindfully, of course, and not just the numb scroll. Yeah. 
you know, I had a lot of fun in the beginning. I bought like a ring light and I got one of these and I was like, I'm going to be doing more online content. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I think it, it forced me and the brand to start producing, you know, more content on Instagram. I mean, I remember in March and April, like the engagement was crazy. You know, we'd be getting hopefully 10 times the amount of likes on posts and story views. And so that was really exciting. Um, but I do agree. Yeah, there's like this feeling of waking up in the morning yet again during the pandemic and checking my phone and endlessly scrolling. And I was falling out of my good habits, like meditating and, you know, just being in the normal routine. Um, Cause I was like, I'm just, yeah, I was feeling a little numb from it all. Um, unable to plan and look forward to things, you know, those are, those are, those are a tough way to live. <laughs> For sure. Almost definitely. I work at a small yoga studio here in town too. And it, that I, I think it was, it was amazing at first how much interaction was going on outside of the studio because we couldn't be open. And now that we're open again, thankfully, safely, of course, um, it, it's been interesting to see what's changed, I guess. But I, I think this year has just been full of changes and we'll keep riffing with it and going with it and pivoting as they say. Yes, exactly. And I love yoga. I will say that um, yoga is the number one thing that I miss from like the pre pandemic world mm -hmm. being in a room full of strangers chanting and getting sweaty. And, you know, we have yoga up here in New York, that, like um, yoga to the people and it, you're literally mat to mat. And I just I don't know. I mean, I know it'll be like probably a year after the vaccine when like that is normal, but will we ever actually feel safe around strangers again if we're in the context of sharing bodily fluids and you know yes. germs and all that <laughs> um my girlfriend led my other friend and i through a, a yoga class the three of us the other day she's a jiva mukti instructor and we were mm. chanting and started bawling because i was like i'm i you know i've been doing online yoga and, and whatever but I, I had really been missing that that, that heat that energy you get from other people um so it's amazing you're a yoga teacher i'm just Yoga is is definitely the the number one thing that makes my life better every day. Yoga has definitely been a life changer for me, and I feel like kind of bringing in the implementation of ahimsa, non harming, to this podcast. We've had a couple of my yoga friends actually on that have some newer ethical based food companies. Um, it really comes down to not even just not harming, but doing better, you know, improving the lives of those around you, improving the longevity of the planet with, you know, any action that you can. And I really enjoyed having this podcast during the pandemic too, because I feel like I still get to do some of that through, you know, working with ethical food companies and hearing what you guys are doing and the innovation that you are bringing into an industry that has not always been the most sustainable. Oh, especially when we're talking about carbon and things like that. And your goal, and I know a couple other kelp companies' goals, have been to really put kelp in the spotlight because it's not um, a taking, taking, taking type of substance. It's actually giving back a lot. And you said you started with startups and you started with conservation. What, I guess, was your first introduction to kelp? Did you grow up on the coast? I did. Yeah. The first kelp farm I visited was pretty close to where I grew up in Connecticut. And I always was that weirdo kid, like running out of the water with seaweed in my mouth and chewing on it. And I just, I love seaweed. I love everything from the ocean. Like I think um, most women that were born in the eighties, you know, we all grew up with like Ariel is like, you know, our, <laughs> this is who we want to be when we grow up. Like, how do I be a mermaid? And, I had a bedspread uh, wallpaper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, where's Prince Eric? Um, so we've, we've, you know, looked at kind of the idea of bringing seaweeds to the U.S. market as something that's also really important. You know, this is a food group that's not only really sustainable, but it's really healthy for you. And here in America, we just didn't grow up eating it. Um, but we a really fortunate a PhD uh, in nutrition is one of our advisors and she's Chinese and lives in Singapore. And, um, you know, she's just, she gets it. She grew up eating seaweed. So she's been really helpful in, in talking about the health benefits and translating that to the American consumer. Mm -hmm. 
I think really the only the the seaweed and kelp exposure that I had growing up was really just with sushi, unfortunately. And yeah. I am totally landlocked here. And I think that's not dissimilar to a lot of other people who didn't grow up on the coast because it's just not it's not something that you walk for, through and you go to like a lake or something like that and you don't know what's in the seaweed and it's not like this magical plant here in the Midwest. Uh -huh. It's like dirty and icky and kind of weird. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I would say the uh, uh, sort of snack that has really opened up consumers to eating more seaweed is again, nori, which is what's wrapped in your sushi, but the nori sheet. So those, those have grown really fast and they're sold at Walmart, you know, which is my test of all right, this is mainstream. And uh, and that growth had about 30% year over year right now, just those nori snacks. And I think, you know, you constantly see seaweed in the headlines for biggest health trends. So like it's coming and really like our job, you know, like Pat at 12 Tides, my job and the other kelp entrepreneurs out there is to like figure out the form factor and how to make it taste good. And we're all doing really different things, which is such an amazing sign of how versatile kelp is. Yes. I think I just saw you, uh, Akua and 12 Tides, and I think a few other companies, are you guys hosting a giveaway right now that's all seaweed based? Was that what I saw or something was going on? Yeah, it's seafood based. So um, Pat, myself, um, founder of uh, Scout Canning, um, Brianna Warner from Atlantic Sea Farms, um, and a, you know, a few other great entrepreneurs, we've all started something called the Seafood Collab. And it's this idea that, you know, we can be growing food at scale without the use of fresh water or dry land. And if done right, aquaculture can be like a really promising food source. And it's gotten a really bad rep over the years. You know, you think of these fish farms and the fish are getting sick because they're too close together. And and I think um, <clears throat> there's just, you know, like everything, a bad way to do something and a good way to do something. And um there is a uh, a kind of re resurgence, and and now we're we're all kind of on the same team of of these seafood folks, and I think it's fun because I don't think a lot of people think about seaweed as seafood, and it totally is. <laughs> yeah, no, most definitely, it's it's not something that I would. I, I would pinpoint in that category, I would think of seafood as being like mollusks and shrimp and things like that. Unfortunately, all the things that I'm allergic to, or maybe fortunately, so I can't even eat those. So I just think seafood is not something that I get to have outside of fish, but I can have kelp too, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. I do know someone that's allergic to kelp, so it does exist. Oh no. She's allergic to seaweed and mushrooms. I was like, oh wow, those two favorite foods right there. That's very I know. sad. <laughs> mushrooms make me so happy. <laughs> And mushrooms are such an interesting food group because it's like it's exploded over the past seven years, basically. And so we believe that seaweed is going to follow in that same trajectory of growth and mass adoption in the U.S. economy. Oh, hands down. It, it was amazing to me when I started um, asking guests to come on the show how many were already out there with with kelp brands and kelp snacks. And again, maybe it's just like my Midwest roots that are like corn and soybeans. But um, it's kind of crazy. Uh, one of the girls from Foraged and Found, who was another um, kelp guest, they have um, pesto and things like that. Fun things out of Ketchikan, Alaska. They're actually just now coming into the lower 49. Hawaii is included. Um, so we'll get them in soon. But they were talking about, um, what was it called? My my silly question was, do you really mix salmon and berries in the same salad dressing? And she said, no, 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 it's a salmon berry. Salmon berry is a berry that we don't have in the Midwest. We don't really have in the lower 49 either. Um, but it's native to Ketchikan, Alaska, where they're based. And they're introducing all of these new foods that we don't get down here. And it, it's it's really just kind of mind-blowing how much we don't realize there are more food sources outside of what you can find in your average grocery store not to bash on the average grocery store but like there's more than tomatoes there's more than kale there's more than um you know kind of your typical basic produce section there's so many new things that maybe we haven't been exposed to because we don't live in the right area or the industries like kelp are just kind of now catching on board with being able to be out there and be tasty too yeah, I mean, I, I love this woman forage and found that sounds incredible. Let me know when they when they launch and, and bring their stuff to New York. It's, yes. it's delicious. Um, yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it, it you mentioned uh, corn and soy and like the, the problem when we get 
too big of any food industry is that it has, you know, a lot of negative effects, like, you know, monocropping destroys the soil as an example. And the more that we can, you know, discover things like salmon berries, you know, it's really exciting. And I think that the, um, also like, you know, the sort of scary future is, is like food is only made from corn and soy and, and we've sort of killed off all of these like smaller, you know, um, species of, of plants and fruits and vegetables um, and kind of like mirrors culture, right? It's like, what, you know, what if we live in a world one day where everyone either speaks Mandarin or English, um, you know, and we've killed off all these smaller cultures and in, in sort of um, in, in seeking some sort of, you know, mass homo homogeneous, you know, type of culture. And uh, it's really sad. So I think those things really can mirror each other. And it's important um, to have as much variety in life as possible. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. I saw I think it was maybe it was just this morning, um, a post from sea trees, which I know is a big deal in the kelp industry as well. What was it? Um, I think they said 90% of all carbon emissions are actually processed by um, marine what do I want to say? Not marine forests, but marine life. Like so much of the carbon reduction is actually happening underwater. Yeah, it, it is. And like, there's a great quote around um, like 50% of the air you breathe is from algae um, uh, or every other breath you take, you know, if you want to say, <laughs> want to say it romantically. Mm -hmm. um, that came up a lot when the Amazon rainforest was burning because we sure. were like, whoa, how does, how do we get the oxygen on this earth? Um, because I think it's like 25% comes from specifically the Amazon rainforest mm -hmm. or something, 18 to 25. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, you know, the, the systems that we have and, and how also scary it is because these systems can be thrown into imbalance very easily. So for sure. So how are you making sure that your system and your um, kelp harvesting stays, stays sustainable and um, regenerative in its nature and also in the harvesting? Yeah. I mean, you know, one, I think pretty easy way to put it is like, we will never wild harvest, mm -hmm. you know, we will, we will never be touching kelp that hasn't been farmed. And there's actually like food safety reasons for this too. Mm -hmm. So we had a supplier sell us some old kelp that had been wild harvested at one point. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't know how long it was sitting in the ocean because it's wild. There's no like, you know, it's not like you cut a tree and you see the rings or something on the kelp. Um, with farming, you know that the kelp is harvested after six months and it's six month old kelp. And all of a sudden in our kelp jerky product this is before we launched, mm -hmm. the kelp jerky was leaching white stuff. And it looked like mold Ooh. and I, my heart sunk to the bottom of my stomach. It wasn't mold, but it, it was salts and minerals. And, uh, one of my investors was like, oh, well maybe you just write on the package, you know, that your product looks like it's mold, but it's actually minerals and salts. And I was like, nah, that's not what I'm writing <laughs> on this package. And so we figured it out that the supplier had lied and sold us kelp that was wild harvested because it was older and the older the kelp, the more minerals it's you know picking up from the sea sure and so it's like when you see seaweed that washes up on the beach like it's just covered in salt because it's leaching that um so farming is really important from like a you know food standardization mm -hmm. point and um and obviously from the environment you know and so when we talk about like building these giant kelp farms you know that are you know helping to reduce ocean acidification and then we're taking that out and we're turning it into jerky and burgers i mean I think that everything you do has a consequence. And I think at the moment, scientists and, and, and people we work with who are much smarter than us don't see any negative consequence to the increasing of kelp farming. And I'm not saying that there won't be because, you know, we can't tell the future. But at the moment, this is a very, very, very net positive type of agriculture. Sure. That was one thing that I really took away from talking with Pat, too, was that that is so mind boggling to me thinking about all of the types of agriculture that we're going to have in the Midwest and not even just in the Midwest, but growing food on land is always going to take from the soil. Like it's really hard to put nutrients back into the soil. You, you can't with the exception of fertilizer. And we're not sure how we feel about that right now. Um, there's natural fertilizers, of course, but it's, it always seems like it's going Help to be is a great taking. fertilizer. Is it really? 
Yeah, it's um, we visited this crazy factory in South Africa. It's Write called it Kelp Pack, and they're one of the biggest kelp fertilizer companies in the world. And they harvest they they wild harvest kelp because in South Africa it's one of the only places where kelp regrows from the stipe. And mm. um, and yeah, they turn it into kelp fertilizer, and it's like it's like a plant growth hormone. It, it works so well. Um, oh so. my gosh, I'm mm-hmm. intrigued. So I've had a couple um, farmer friends already on or to be on that have discussed like their no tilling and organic farming because obviously we still need to be able to get food from the dry land, but doing it in the best way possible. And that is something that I feel like they would be interested in that has not made it way to the Midwest in a large scale yet. Thank you for that. Oh, happy day. Cool. So kelp Perfect. is giving back to dry land, not just wetland either. Yeah, exactly. I mean, oh, what can kelp not do, truly? True. <laughs> True. That's exciting. Oh, way cool. So let's talk a little bit about what you are currently offering and what you are offering in the future. Right now, the, the flagship product was the jerky. When did you come out with that? We launched the jerky on Earth Day 2019. Okay. <sighs> um, and so we... We actually reformulated it twice. Um, it's a very tough product to make. And getting people really excited about eating kelp jerky um, was was hard. People were like, what? And then, you know, they would look at it and, and they would see it. And it's kind of like brown. And, you know, I'm not going to eat it because it's, it's very messy. <laughs> and, you know, and it, it was a struggle. And we really were pushing the health benefits. You know, it was like zero sugar and it was so healthy for you. And then we realized like, we needed to put probably a little bit of sweet in it. So we used sure. apricot mm. and we reformulated it. And so it's zero added sugar, but there is like three grams of sugar for an entire bag. So it's still low. Yeah. But that slight reformulation really helped the product taste a lot better. Sugar is really important when you dehydrate a product, which is what we're doing with kelp jerky. And it maintains moisture as you dehydrate. And when we look at like Pan's mushroom jerky, my friend Michael's company, Mm -hmm. amazing product, 14 grams of added sugar. I mean, it's delicious for a reason, right? Sure. And so most meat jerkies, most plant-based jerkies have a lot of sugar. So we had to add a little bit to make it more delicious, but it's still very healthy. Um, We did kelp pasta, which I think you mentioned at the beginning. Literally, this is a kelp you know, that has been farmed and you blanch it so that it turns brown to bright green. And then you throw it through a calamari cutter and you shape it in like a ball and you dehydrate it. And so it's, it's not a fancy processed product. It's literally just straight up kelp and you can eat it as a pasta alternative or greens. It's so delicious. And then our, um, you know, our thinking when we started this company was how do we replace the most unsustainable form of food production being factory farming Mm -hmm. with the most sustainable form of food production being ocean farming. And we wanted to always be a meat alternative food company. And, uh, and yeah, in January, we started working on our kelp burger. So really, really excited to be bringing that to market, uh, early 2021. Excellent. And then you have currently, um, a campaign going on republic.co where mm-hmm. folks can actually support the release the funding of the, the release of that burger and also invest in the company at the same time that's right yeah i mean wow so i'm i'm a true community builder at heart you know i was that kid on an airplane walking around introducing myself to everyone being like oh where are you going today <laughs> and i'm courtney i'm going to you know disney world whatever and our um you know that that community building um, drive never left me throughout whatever business I was working on. And when we launched Kelp Jerky, we actually launched on Kickstarter first. This is 2018. And we raised about $80,000 and we had over 1,200 people that had signed up to to buy kelp jerky. And we were like, amazing. Um, It took us a year to bring them their kelp jerky. So that was a little stressful, but, you know, we learned a lot in the process. Um, You know, we have a kelp club on Facebook, which is we're not selling you anything in that kelp club. We're just sharing information about seaweed. And then um, when this year happened, that is 2020, uh, we were fundraising. It was really hard to raise traditional capital. Mm -hmm. And Republic, which is an equity crowdfunding platform, approached us and said, why don't you raise money on our platform when someone invests in you for a hundred dollars, they're basically buying shares in the company. And I was like, I love this approach because 
right now we have over $160,000 raised from over 300 investors. Now I had a call with someone who put 600 bucks into the company and they were like, hey, I want to help you get into this restaurant in my hometown. I was like, amazing. We now have over 300 people in the Akua tribe who are all fighting for us to succeed. Mm. Like, that's amazing. You know, it's like so cool. Um, I, you know, it, we had this woman who backed us on Kickstarter and every time we host a sale, she buys and she puts $600 into the campaign. And that $600 means so much more to me mm -hmm. than any 50K check from someone whose job it is to invest in startups, like a VC. Sure. Like, that woman is like family, you know? Um, and I don't even know her. And she's just, she just believes in what we're doing so much. So I, I think that that is, it's been such an amazing experience. And I think more and more companies, especially mission-driven ones that are, mm -hmm. you know, building truly aspirational brands are going to find success with equity crowdfunding as the, also the, the public becomes more educated on, on what it is and, and how it works. For sure. That was a new thing for me to see like an, like you called it an equity crowdfunding. Um, would you still call it a campaign or just equity crowdfunding business? I do call it a campaign. Yeah. Okay. Our campaign ends April 1st. That's okay. when the, the round closes. And, um, you know, it's, it's imp a lot of people see crowdfunding and just think, oh, I'm going to get like a prize and you do get prizes. And so mm -hmm. it's really important to be like, no, this is like you going on to fidelity.com and you putting in, you know, a hundred dollars into Amazon, except you're going to put a hundred dollars into Akua and you're going to own a lot more of our company than if you put a hundred dollars into Amazon. Now, obviously the risk is higher when you're putting money into a startup, but that's, what's so fun about investing in startups. Cause while the risk is higher, the upside is also higher. Well, for sure. And you're backing a company that you believe in that is trying to change the world essentially, or at least change the food and beverage industry, but changing the world at the same time. Exactly. I love it. Oh, so cool. So you have, let's see, did I see four flavors of kelp jerky out right now? We do. Yeah. We've got hibachi teriyaki. That's our newest and it's so good. Mm. I don't know whether it's like definitely the best flavor or just because I've eaten so much of the other three flavors. So the newest one's always going to be the best. Sure. Um, but I just think like we should have done teriyaki from the beginning. It's a natural uh, pairing with mushrooms and seaweed. And then we have um, our best seller is the, the sesame and nori sea salt, which, you know, is delicious. We actually had a batch that got really salty the other week and people, and we just put it on our website as super salty sesame, 40% off and people are like flying through it. <laughs> um, we have a spicy chili and lime and uh, then we have a rosemary maple barbecue. There we um, go. Yeah. You like the barbecue. So I have not had it yet and I'm going oh. to pick some up. It was my intention to pick some up um, yesterday. You guys had a super awesome um, Cyber Monday sale. But then also, let's see, is it the Republic? Do, is it is there a percentage off if you back the Republic campaign? Is it 10 percent or 20 percent? Well, if you put 100 bucks or 150 bucks in, you get a free four pack. But Julia, I will, hook you, I will hook you up. <laughs> oh, girl, I would love to support it anyways. No, it was my intention from the beginning. I don't know how we arrived at today's dis this recording date is December 1st. I don't know how November happened and how Thanksgiving happened. And it's just been absolute madness. But I saw the the teriyaki flavor on your website this morning and I thought of my little brother because whenever we would go on road trips as a family, teriyaki jerky was his like gas station snack. Oh my gosh, amazing. And it was, it was, it, that's just like the classic flavor that I feel like people think of when they're thinking about jerky obviously perhaps the meat one and not necessarily the kelp one as that's a little bit newer but to have that kind of similar flavor profile I feel like it'd be such a good introductory flavor for anybody because it's still going to taste the same yeah essentially like the spices and the flavor profile are still going to be the same and then you also have did I see kelp and lemon pepper seasoning too you came out with the seasoning yeah, um, we are doing like uh, these small little tins, which have like kelp and salt and, you know, all sorts of like lemon and garlic and pepper. And this is a perfect product for someone who is scared to eat seaweed because sure. 
the spice blend is very neutral. It's going to, you put it on everything and you're just going to get a little bit of that kelp flavor, mm -hmm. a tiny bit. And then you're going to get all the vitamins and mineral benefits of it as well. Um, and this is like a perfect stocking stuffer, you know, perfect thing to just show up to a dinner party with and, you know, put it on everything. So yeah, big fan of our kelp spices. Excellent. And then the burger. So I'm assuming that's still kind of an R&D, but... Do you have, are there going to be different flavors or different varieties or can we talk about that? Yeah, it's totally okay if we can't. <laughs> no, we can, we can totally talk about it. Um, so we basically have, um, you know, our, our kind of original flavor coming out next mm -hmm. year. That'll be, you know, the, the tried and true one. Um, you know, I think with a burger, it's important when you're just starting to have something that's like not too overpowering in a taste profile because people like to make their own burgers. Sure. You know, they like to put cheese on them or, or avocado or ketchup or mayo, whatever. And so you kind of want to have that original. And then um, I think the two things that I'm, I'm really excited about in terms of new kelp burger flavors are, mm -hmm. are one is, is something a little like spicy mm -hmm. and, and fiery because my co-founder who does our burgers, his name's Spicy Lebo. And then um, a miso burger, you know, something Ooh. we have to, we have to figure out like a soy free miso type thing, um, like maybe coconut aminos or something. But yeah, just having that, like, you know, that salty Asian combo, I think will be really good. But sure. yeah, what do you, what are your favorite burger flavors? Oh man. So I, anything spicy, anything chipotle or adobo seasoning, um, big fan of adobo chilies actually, but man, it's hard to say. I, when you said miso, I got really excited because I really just, I still like, and on, on occasion crave that umami meaty sort of like texture and taste without it being meat. And I yep. feel like miso almost kind of gives you that. Like I am, I am, my sweet fiance just does not understand some of my food combinations sometimes, or I will just put some veggie broth and some miso paste in a cup and it's my warm glowy goodness throw some turmeric and some coconut oil in there that's like my winter tonic where I'm like I'm cold my face is dry my bones are dry and I just need like nourishing goodness so I, I would be up for the miso or the coconut aminos whatever you end up going for that direction yeah. So I'm like you, I don't think there's pretty much anything better than just like a hot miso broth. Like I always have a big container of miso in my fridge. I chuck it in everything, mushrooms. Mm -hmm. I, I do the same thing. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of sensitivity around like soy free, especially in the sure. vegan community. So with the burger and, you know, we've made a pledge to like our customers that will always be free of the eight major allergens mm -hmm. and, and whatever allergens are out there to be free of, you know, we want to be as, as, as clean and conscious as possible. But uh, yeah, miso is one of those things. I'm like, Ooh, but don't you just want some miso in your burger? It's like, you know, <laughs> I know soy is a thing and most, and, and not eating meat too, or not much. I, I do have the occasional bit when I travel, I'm always going to be honest about enjoying cultural experiences, but I don't cook meat. I don't eat meat. I don't order meat, but that, that's been kind of the difficulty is that soy is such a major substitute. It's been nice over the past few years to have companies come out with soy free vegan alternatives because I know a lot of people cannot have that as it is a known hormone disruptor and an allergen and mm -hmm. it's not always the most um, non-GMO and organic friendly sort of substance, unfortunately. Um, but it's affordable. Again, it's one of those things that we've kind of like pigeonholed ourselves into relying on soy so much as a protein and meat substitute that it's nice to see other things coming in and saying, hey, that's not the only option. Like yeah. this is way better and healthier and better for the planet. So here you go. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens with pea protein. Sure. Because this is what we use in our products to yeah. like boost us and... I think it P is, is right now in, in good graces with people mm -hmm. and, you know, people are like, Oh, P is better than soy, but like that could flip the switch in like four years. Right. We don't know. So, um, paying close attention always to ingredients, I think is like a really important thing for a founder. And, mm -hmm. you know, once you hit huge scale, like to just swap out an ingredient like P would be like a nightmare. <laughs> So you have to really do as men, as much research as you can before like mm -hmm. choosing ingredients in your food. Um, and yes, we read studies. Yes, we have nutritionists on our, you know, our, our team. But I think the most important thing too is just to like 
eat your product every freaking day Mm -hmm. before you launch it and just see how you feel. Right. You know, it's like, does this make you feel good and mm-hmm. energized? And does it make the people you're feeding it to feel good too? Um, Cause that, that body awareness is, I think it's so crucial and it's not something that's talked enough about in health. No, that is, if you're friends with me, we're going to talk about digestion because. <laughs> yeah. And poop all day long. And poop, all of the poop. It's so important. I, if Matt can hear this, he's probably just like, did she bag. say that? Yes. <laughs> all of the fiber, please. But it's yeah. so, it's so important. And so many alternatives, I think, you know, maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, when people were just like, I need an alternative and I don't really care what I'm putting in it. That was kind of the first substitutes, unfortunately, or I think people had a certain amount of caring, but it was let's find a meat substitute that we can market, not let's be careful as to what we're putting into it due to so many common allergens or desires or friggin' hormone disruption with soy and estrogen. Um, Unfortunately, when, you know, I started exploring different meat alternatives, a lot of them didn't sit well with my stomach and that was really sad. Pea protein does, thankfully. Um, one of the, the proteins that are just drinkable proteins that I use is pea protein based and I have had the best luck with that over anything else as far as energy and digestion wise. So hopefully we don't find any, well, there always, there's always going to be new advancements in what we're finding with food ingredients, but hopefully pea protein stays among one of the good ones because... I think for me, that's been one of the best. And then working at the health food store that I used to work at, that was usually a safe one too. But it was still kind of taking a while to catch on. I feel like there were still other ones that were a little bit more common to people. They weren't asking for pea protein yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you got to watch the how your digestion feels. I think most people I know who are in the health food space and who are very knowledgeable started out with some health issue. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, it's digestion. Yeah. Um, You know, I think that was, that was part of my journey too. I don't know, like how, you know, deep you want to get on your podcast, but like one of the things I think it's not talked about a lot is how birth control will like totally eradicate your gut biome. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was my, thankfully I went on birth control when I was you know 15 and (laughs) there were benefits to it, but right. The drawbacks were were huge. And um, when I went off of birth control, kind of in my late 20s, I had to rebuild my gut biome. Mm -hmm. And I I just learned so much about food and health and my body throughout that process. Um, And everyone's journey is unique and individual. But I think a lot of women today are unaware of of the birth control side effects for the gut biome, which Mm -hmm. just, yeah, it's, it's, it sucks. It's, it's definitely something that's not quite made its way to the mainstream or at least something until, again, you go off of it. And then they're like, wait a sec, I'm all messed up. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> your body got used to having something inside it that's a little bit foreign. And uh, now you've taken it away. And essentially, it's not that different with, you know, any other industry, too. We have to we have to figure out what's going on right now within our bodies, within, in the, within the industry, within um, the community, and then figure out, okay... What got us to this point? How can we get out of it? How can we rebuild? I feel like this year, especially in just life in general, is always in a constant state of finding new things out and rebuilding. And I mean, you just got to keep going with it, I guess. But it'd be nice if we had all of the answers right away. But we will continue to be (laughs) flexible in body, mind, and spirit and (laughs) continue to roll with it. Sure. Definitely. Well, do you have any suggestions for consumers or entrepreneurs looking to get into the kelp industry or at least focus more on regenerative or marine forestation and farming? Um, yeah, you know, I think that it's it's there's some great books and and videos out there like Eat Like a Fish is by mm-hmm. Brent Smith. He's a the nonprofit founder of Green Wave and that really gives an amazing history of kind of the ocean farming industry and, and the opportunities that are in there. I know a lot of people who are kind of like Brent Smith disciples. Um, he's 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 awesome. Uh, and he's why I started Akua. Um, you know, I met him and, and heard his vision and I was like, how can I help? You know, and he's like, we need help building a consumer market for kelp. Um, you know, and I also just encourage entrepreneurs to think about seaweed as a food source, you know, and, and incorporating it into their products. Um, 
you know, don't do kelp burgers or kelp jerky. That's our territory. But, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot you can do. And I think um, we are very much in like a rising tide lifts all boats mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a small industry. So it really does take, you know, a lot of boats to, to lift that tide. And our, I think the last thing is like, you know, just um, increasingly talk about food sustainability sure. and the link between that and food health for your body and the earth body being connected. And, you know, it sounds a little woo woo, but I, I, know love you're, that. I know you're on the train, <laughs> I'm on the train, um, but just getting, getting more people uh, to have that, that conscious thought process is important. The food body and earth body connection. Yeah. That's my new favorite phrase. I, love that. I might <laughs> steal sure. that. I it's will tell you. them it's yours. <laughs> it's all you. And then what do you like to eat best when you're not eating your own kelp products? Yeah. Um, so, oh, my, uh, daily gem is a company, uh, it's called gem and they're these little edible vitamins with spirulina and corella. And like, I think it's like 10 or 12 different mm. vitamins and minerals in this one little chew. And they're like maybe, maybe 25 calories or something. And so every morning I wake up, I love coffee and I take my Vitamix and I put like French press coffee. Mm-hmm. I put four sigmatic mushrooms. Mm. I put maca for energy, um, whatever adaptogens I have in my closet, like a big heaping scoop of nut butter mm-hmm. and then like some warm oat milk or almond milk, whatever I have in my fridge. And that's like my coffee, right? But that's really like a meal. And then I have my little daily gem for breakfast and I'm full like a hundred percent until, you know, lunchtime. Um, so yeah, that's a routine. I think routines always change, but that's a routine that's been with me for a few years. I love that. I feel like I've heard of this daily gem. I will check that out again. I think I've at least seen it online for something. Yeah, the founder Sarah Collins in LA. She's awesome. She's a, a seaweed sister. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of her company and her products. Cool. I love it. Well, Courtney, thank you so, so much for joining me today. I know your schedule is busy with the new product launching and everything going on for the holidays. And I really, really appreciate you um, adding your wisdom to everything kelp because we're still all learning about it. It's still kind of new. And I learn something every episode and I know our listeners do too. And I really appreciate it. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for sharing our story with your listeners. It's you are been so great welcome. to be on. <laughs> and guys, you can find them at akua.co. You can order online. You can find them in some shops in the Bay Area. And then Life Akua on Instagram is your account there. And you have the most beautiful pictures and content. I'm in love with it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, guys.